the Heritage House, Jerusalem Heritage House. And we host uh, Jewish, young Jewish students, travelers, and lone soldiers. Um, now with the corona, it's mostly lone soldiers. But, um, and we host them here in the old city and we try to provide them with the Jewish experience, uh, expose them to everything about Israel, Judaism, the Jewish people, you know, all the, all the good things. And so before, you know, before, you know, COVID and sort of when it was sort of normal, um, you know, tell me who are the kinds of people who would be, uh, how so did we, they to you and how did. Yeah, so I mean, we have a lot of people after birthright trips, you know, uh, birthright trips are 10 days long, but uh, participants can extend their trip. Uh, but once they do, they're no longer, you know, with the birthright group, so they need somewhere to stay. So we get people from those trips, uh, people just traveling. Uh, people on MASA programs, uh, you know, long-term programs in Israel. We don't uh, host yeshiva students uh, in general because uh, we're more of an outreach, uh, you know, organization. But we do host, you know, uh, people on other programs that maybe are not as uh, religious oriented. Um, and a lot of lone soldiers, a lot of people, you know, who come from other countries to serve in the army here and their family is overseas. So we have people who live here for... Uh, Long term, we have people who live here for short term. We have people who just drop in whenever they. Our facility is free, so people drop in whenever they feel like it. It's a world. World, you know, the Jewish world. A lot of times they take twenty four six, but we're actually open twenty four seven. And so, what is it? You're you're more than. I mean, you're not a hostel. You're more than that. Right. We're not really. We're not a hostel. We don't charge money. Uh, you know, we're not. We're not a business in any way. Uh, we're kind of like a dormitory, I guess you could say, uh, for the Jewish world. And so do you teach, uh, you, you're teaching classes as well. I mean, it's not just beds, right? So, his, well, so historically, you know, we worked very closely with the yeshivas, Eishat Torah or Sameach, uh, other yeshivas with the COVID, obviously not so much. Um, so, but of course we, we do try, we try to work with them as much as possible, but in the event that, you know, it's not possible or whatever. So we will have classes here. We have, uh, you know, Parsha classes on, you know, different uh different things. We have a library that they can use and I'm available to speak to, you know, it's very individualistic, meaning everybody comes from a different place. So it's very difficult to have any kind of like uh, standard approach to anybody. There's no standard. Every single person's different. And when it comes to the lone soldiers, we have people who just found out they're Jewish and we have people who grew up like in Lakewood. So we had everything and in between. So uh, every person has different you know, different needs. So tell me about a, a story or two of people who sort of found their way to you and sort of really completely at a left field. Yeah, I mean, we have people, you know, we, we, we have, we had a person who, you know, came to us because he, he, he wanted to go to the Marines in America, but he had too many tattoos for that. They have a, a rule against that. Um, so he came to join the Israeli army, but there were, you know, that took, it didn't happen overnight. So he was sleeping in a park. Uh, so he came to us and, you know, we took him in, he did the army, you know, he's, uh, he, 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 he always was Jewish, of course, uh, but he didn't necessarily identify so much as a Jew. And, and now of course he does. Um, and he had a very successful service and we're very happy with that. Um, other people, you know, came after our birthright trip and, you know, ended up staying in yeshiva for years. We oh, we had one, two, two guys came on a Friday night on Shabbos. They uh, they had been on volunteering on a farm. It didn't work out, so they ran away from the farm, and uh, they had no money. And, in Israel. Uh, yeah, yeah, and they and they were just walking through Jaffa Gate, and some other guy standing at the house met them and said, "Why don't you come stay here? It's free." So they came, and uh, one of them is still in yeshiva on Orsamech. That was you know six years ago or something. <laughs> Now, how do people find you other than online? Do people are, do you go out there and sort of- It's a lot, a lot of word of mouth. Thing? It's a lot of word of mouth, uh, you know. Um, we're very, it's a very open setting. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't even lock the door. You know, it's a very open setting. So, you know, we, we kind of got to worry a little bit about who finds us. So um, a lot of it's word of mouth. So how do you track people? Because I know that you've got some- um, um, you know, uh, critics sort of uh, who, who don't like your your pro-Israel attitude. So how do you know the people who are coming in aren't seeking to do you harm? So we don't we don't know. We don't know. We don't know that. But again, we're, we, you know, we're not doing anything. We're not doing anything illegal. 
you know, and we're not doing anything, uh, you know, uh, that is morally questionable. We are openly a pro-Israel, pro-Jewish organization. So, I mean, if you don't like that kind of stuff, you're probably not going to be very happy here. But um, if you do like those things, you're probably going to be very happy here. So, I mean, uh, I think that, yeah, there are some people out there who think we're a little maybe too Jewish, too pro-Israel. You know, I don't know. I, we, haven't, we haven't had any serious problems. Right. So, you know, tell me a little bit about, um, you know, the, what is your, your relationship then? You know, you're in the old city. Sort of what's your relationship like sort of with the, uh, with the sort of the Arab community, the Muslim community? You know, is it, is it there? Do they are, is there interaction at all? Because uh, I want to ask you separately about the work that you're doing resettling, you know, uh, Judea and Samaria. But tell me about your, your you know, your role there. Sure. I mean, uh, again, we have a lot of Arab neighbors here in the old city. I don't know if people realize how many. Uh, some estimates are as much as 30,000. Uh, just with, I don't know if that's really accurate, but that's what they say uh, inside the wall. So, of course, we are seeing Arabs all the time. Uh, you know, Muslims, uh, less Christians, but also Christians. Um, and Armenians as well, of course. Other kind of Orthodox Christians. Um, again, we have all kinds of different relationships. I would say a lot of, a lot of them are you want to call it professional or whatever you want to call it, meaning we are we shop in their stores or we use their services. Uh, for example, in the old city, to get anything around uh, a lot of the areas, you have to have tractors. You can't, there's no way to do it without tractors. And all the tractor drivers are Arabs. So, so you know, so, so you deal with them, you know. Uh, I've been dealing with some of them for over 10 years, 15 years. I know them. I see them all the time. Um, so, you know, we have some good relations. Of course, there are people who are, most of the people I would say with the negative don't live in the neighborhood. They normally come from outside, uh, you know, but, um, but uh, in general, I'm not going to say we don't ever have problems in certain in, in times of what we call in times of terrorism and seasons of terror, like the stabbing into father, things like that. So obviously then things are a bit, you know, not so nice, but uh, for the most part, um, you know, relations are fine. You know, better, so, better than people would expect. That's interesting. Um, so tell, tell me about your way, what you're doing in, you know, we're, we're friends on Facebook and I'm seeing you're always sort of doing excavations and everyone, what, what is that you're doing? Uh, so, in the, in the so yeah, that's, so one of the things we've, uh, we've launched or whatever you want to call it, is that we think, of course, classes are great, you know, Torah study and different things like that. That's all great. But a lot of people got ADHD these days, like pretty much everyone. And uh, Sorry, I forgot. I wasn't listening. What'd you say? Sorry. <laughs> and, you know, and they're on their phones. And it's very difficult to capture people's attention these days. So we have uh, tried this new technique. It's used in other places. Well, I, I compare it in some ways to Habitat for Humanity, you know, and which we, for which we, um, you know, we like, uh, we take them to do work projects. They have meaning. They're not just working for no reason. We take them to important sites and we work on different things, whether it's uh, rebuilding ancient synagogues, uh, clearing out areas, helping schools or different sites, all kinds of different stuff. And they get a tour of the area. Again, a lot of times they're in Hebron or places like Shiloh, you know, places with, you know, real, or the old city, Jerusalem with real historic significance. And uh, so they get, to, they get to hear about that. And then they get to be part of that. So they get to hear the story and then they become part of the story. And of course, our goal is that they'll continue as part of the story their entire lives. That's really our goal, right? Our real goal is that these people will see themselves as permanently part of the Jewish story. And how else better to do that than to connect them with the story physically? Uh, so that's, that's what we do. So, uh, so tell me about some of the things that you're doing then in, um, you know, in Hebron. Like, well, when I see these pictures, so what is it specifically that you're doing? So uh, we have a lot of projects in Hebron, but uh, one of them would be the most prominent would be the graves of Yishai and Ruth, right? Yishai, Jesse, the father of King David, and Ruth, the great grandmother of King David, is a site in Hebron, an ancient Hebron, and it's uh, a bit neglected for various reasons. And, uh, you know, we, we, you know, we clean up the trash there. We, uh, we've, you know, cleaned up debris there and we've, some of the structures were not in the best shape and we're working on that. 
and we're trying to make it more conducive to a Jewish presence. And a lot of times the questions we'll get from the, from the students, the participants will be, I don't understand. Why am I the one doing this work? What about you know the rest of the Jewish world? And that's a very good question. I don't necessarily have an answer for that, but at the end of the day, it's really good for them to do this stuff. You know, it has a big impact on their lives. Whether or not they see themselves as part of the Jewish people in the future might be dependent on how much they work on this on this site, how much they understand the meaning of it. So that's uh, that's an example. We have uh, you know. Um, other synagogues that we're working on that aren't ancient necessarily, but they're in places that are of incredible strategic importance to the Jewish people, uh, both historically and today. And they can learn about the whole, you know, the whole modern political, geopolitical situation by just being in this area. And then they actually get to participate in it as well. So what do you mean by that? I want to, you know, ask you about that. You said sort of not just historically, but the, you know, the relevance strategically for the Jewish people in Israel today. What are you talking about? What does that mean? Well, I mean, for example, uh, and we have a lot of stuff like that, but for example, if you, we take them out to the Shomron, to Samaria, you know, you hear a lot about the settlements and uh, the, the occupation and all these different things, but you, you know, very few people actually get to see it and understand what's actually going on. So we take them, we take them right into the, you know, where they can see, oh, okay, here are the roads, here's the dynamic, you know, uh, Jews aren't allowed in this area because they're Jewish. Uh, Arabs are allowed to use the roads. You know, we thought they weren't allowed to, but here we see they are. How, I, the news told me they can't do that. Well, here I see they can do that, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, the different Jewish communities, what they're like, and also how they connect to one another. And it's very often not like they thought. I, me I remember we took three students from Duke University, which is considered a very good university in America. And, uh, I took them to a bris, you know, to a circumcision in, a, in what's called an outpost, in, a, in an outpost, all right? And uh, they, were, they were blown away by this entire experience. And I said, how are things going, guys? And they said, listen, one of them said to me, listen, we go to Duke. We are very smart and we know a lot about the world. And this is not what we were expecting at all. So we're going to need a minute to process this. And that's not uncommon, really. I mean, the, maybe that was a little <laughs> duke of them to talk like that. But uh, that's, you know, that's not uncommon. We take people out there and like, this is not what I thought I was going to see here. They're like shocked by it. Well, now, now, are you, do you see yourself? You know, oh, sorry, I'm um, Did you see yourself also in part of, uh, you know, many of the people who become in, in, involved with you? I know right now it's mostly lone soldiers, but in general, you know, the people, they, you know, they're coming from, I guess, uh, primarily outside of Israel, correct? Yes, yes, of course. And Mostly do most of them, Canada, and, England. right, and do most of them after a sort of experience, what's the average length of time that they, they spend, uh, you know, at, uh, with you? I would say there's no real average. Every single person is different. I mean, some people stay one night and that's, that's what they got. And some people stay for weeks. It just really depends on what they're doing, how they're growing you know how they're enjoying also um it's it's very much like a every single person is a different relationship and uh it's real you know there's no real standard anything except for the fact that we you know are very pro-jewish and very pro-israel and uh so that doesn't change uh but we everybody's experience is like totally i mean again we have people coming from all over the spectrum all over the all over the place. So, you know, it's hard to, you know, we do bar mitzvahs for people, you know, and we, and who didn't have bar mitzvahs. And we have people who grew up in Lakewood and, you know, know the Torah by heart. And we, you know. So tell me about some of the people you mentioned that some of the lone soldiers or something, I don't know if you thought lone soldiers, but others didn't even know they were Jewish. I mean, how, how do they end up at you if they don't even know they're Jewish? Like, what, what kind of stories are they? Well, we have like a guy who grew up Catholic. You know, his mother was technically was Jewish, but she converted to Catholicism. And, uh, you know, he just, all of a sudden he met these cousins who were Jewish and he started asking questions. And they were like, yeah, you know, we're kind of Jewish, you know? And then it's, it, you would say to yourself, well, how does he get from that to joining the army? But surprisingly, 
um, you know, the Israeli army has a very interesting reputation of the world as being a very dynamic, you know, miraculous situation. And all of a sudden, it clicks in these people's heads that maybe they're, and they actually are, eligible to serve in it. So um, it's not such a big jump in, in some ways. We have a guy who's a uh, very interesting story. His mother was Jewish, uh, but actually passed away. And he was raised by his father, who wasn't Jewish, and his stepmother, who wasn't Jewish. But technically speaking, of course, all four kids are Jewish. And they, uh, his father actually got a job with a Jewish guy, a uh, Jewish guy's bank. And uh, so he, you know, got involved and realized the kids were all Jewish. And one of their, their kid came and joined the army. And we did a bar mitzvah for him. On Rosh oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And so you know, the, the people who, when they're coming to you from around the world, most of them and many of them end up making Aliyah or sort of this is like a, just a temporary uh, spot for visiting. It, it, it goes all over the place. There's a good number of people who make Aliyah. I wouldn't say anywhere near a majority um, of all our guests, probably something like 15%, I guess. But like, you know, it's a nice, a nice group. I mean, thank God we have weddings all the time over here. We had a wedding for a guy last week. Hopefully we're gonna have an engagement soon. You know, we have guys, I've done weddings for people over here who stayed in the house. So it's, uh, we do have a very like beautiful, like community kind of forming over here as well, uh, which really wasn't part of the plan. But uh, it's very nice anyway. Um, but, you know, we don't, we're not an Aliyah, you know, we don't push Aliyah. Everybody's got to do what they, you know, is the best thing for them. And for some people, so some people are in the middle of their education, some people are in the middle, you know, whatever. So um, we are, every, again, it's very everybody at their own situation. We don't have a, we don't have a real, you know, s s standard goal with people. We just, we're just, you know, pro-Jewish, pro-Israel trying to move people, you know. Now, do people ever sort of, you know, find their way to you who, you know, not necessarily anti-Israel with an agenda, but, you know, maybe they're open-minded, but maybe they're critical of Israel, maybe however, whatever brings them there. I mean, how do you engage, how do you engage those people and sort of- Well, uh, I mean, yeah, sure, sure. And, um, but there are, there's different kinds with that too, of course, you know, there's people who are just ignorant, you know, God bless them. And um, they just don't know a lot. And they, so, you know, we try to educate them and sometimes they're honest about it and they'll acknowledge that and they'll learn from that. And sometimes, you know, they, they, they won't, you know, it just kind of all depends. We had one guy here who was especially critical and he uh, told me he went on a tour of Hebron with a, with an Arab tour guide from Ramallah and it was like a concentration camp. I said, wow. So I said, you went to Yad Vashem Right? He said, yeah. I said, okay, so what were the similarities? He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I don't know, were they like wearing uniforms? No. Were they like fenced in? No. Did you see anybody getting killed? No. You know, I was like, well, then, I mean, what was the similarities? And he was like, I don't know, the tour guy just said it's like that. So a guy like that, you know, what do you, and I mean, like, you know, if you want to, you know, you don't want to be honest, you don't want to be open, so I can't, you know deal with that but we actually had a guy here who was, would consider himself very left wing and we were in Chevron with him and uh and other people and we're going to do some work and he said he said Packer just do me a favor don't take any pictures of this you know but I'm gonna I'm gonna work now I said what are you doing man you know you're supposed to be like against this and he said listen when you see it in front of you it's a little different so just let me do my thing and I was like, yeah, here's, here's a shovel. Good luck, man. You know, so, so you know, there, again, there's a lot of ignorance out there and people who want to be honest about it, you know. But, you know, there are people who just have a different way of looking at life. They have different priorities. They have different philosophies. You know, I, you know, I, we just, you know, agree to disagree, I guess you could say, or whatever you want to say. But, you know, some people, they don't. Their philosophy doesn't allow for the existence of a state of Israel or for a, or for a Jewish peoplehood. I, you know, I'm not I'm not in the business of forcing people to do anything. So, uh, you know, we just we just roll with it. Well, but now, I, you must you must have some I would say, stories. I, Sorry, I would say that it's over overstated in general. Most young American Jews 
A lot of them are coming from intermarried families. And it's not a kind of devious plot or something. You know, they're just, they're coming with a lack of strong Jewish identity. They're definitely coming with a lack of strong Jewish education. So what do you, so what do you expect? You know, if, 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 it would be weird if they weren't like that. So, you know, that's what we're, that's our crowd. So, you know, it's okay. It's okay. Now, you, you mentioned in the beginning that you really see, obviously, you're, you're not just trying to give these people sort of a bed. You're really trying to sort of uh, educate them and, and do some Jewish outreach as well. Can you tell us sort of maybe a little bit about the kinds of, uh, you know, engagement that your education that you provide these kids? Well, keep in mind, they're staying in the old city of Jerusalem, right in the heart of the Jewish community here. And this is a very welcoming community. Uh, you know, I know Toronto is also a very welcoming community, but this is a very welcoming community, even amongst people who don't speak the same language they do. So, and it's also a very religious community, you know, extremely in ways religious community, and yet it's very open. That means these, these kids, the students, they can participate. I mean, now it's COVID, you know, so, you know, but besides that, they go to people's weddings from the neighborhood when they're here. Whatever I'll go to, they'll come to. So they go to weddings, they go to bar mitzvahs, family events that people are having in the neighborhood. Of course, Shabbos meals, obviously. Um, they participate in the neighborhood pretty much as best as they can. They pray in the synagogues. They, of course, go to the Western Wall. They, uh, they become participants in this thing. And the old city is... I lived in the old city for 20 years, okay? I can tell you that people who don't live here don't know what goes on here. The people who live in the city are so special and so holy. Of course, I'm not talking about myself, but my neighbors are, you wouldn't believe the sense of purpose these people live with. It is, I live with them for a long time and I'm shocked by it. And the participants here, they feel that. They feel that. Sometimes they can't understand a word they're saying, but they, it doesn't matter. They, they feel that. You know, when you go to someone's wedding, he doesn't know who you are and can't speak your language. And he's getting married and he hugs you. I mean, what more could you ask for? I mean, that is, that is a beautiful experience. That's a beautiful Jewish experience, you know? And we have it all the time. So, so you know, the location plays a major role in that. They are every, you go, just go into the grocery store here is an educational experience, you know? Uh, all the different, why is this guy going through the vegetables and pulling, you know, pulling some out? Oh, he's, you know, he's tithing the vegetables. That's, that's what we do. You know, it's like things that of course go on in Toronto as well. Um, they're, but they, they're in the, they're in it, you know, and uh, that's pure education all the time. And, and it's amazing. It's really, it's, it's amazing. Thing. How, how many, uh, how many Jews live in the old city then? Or sorry, so in, we, in, in the Rove, in the Jewish quarter. Specifically. In the Jewish quarter, I think the estimate is something like 4,000. 4,000. And how many, I know there are some Jews who live in the airport. How many Jews who live in the in the old city outside the Jewish quarter? About another thousand. Oh, really? And they're mostly in the Muslim quarter? Uh, mostly. There are some, some Jews live in the Christian quarter as well, but uh, mostly in the Muslim quarter, I guess you could say. Now, just, to, you know, I know this isn't necessarily something that you're involved with, but as a guy who's been living in the old city for 20 years, I mean, what's sort of the dynamic, what's the trajectory of the Jewish uh, life or population in the old city? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? Is it is it more stable, less stable? What's happening? So, it, 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 so it's growing, but it's growing, maybe, of course, slower than we'd like because the old city is not just, you know, it, 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 it's complicated. You know, a lot of the property here is not owned by individuals. It's owned by organizations. That, that's also, by the way, true of a lot of Jewish properties as well. If we think about the yeshivas and think about the, the synagogues and all these kinds of things. Um, so in the old city itself, I mean, if you, a huge percentage of the property in the old city is owned by churches, you know, the Greek Orthodox church, especially, but also other churches. Um, a lot of the Muslim property, uh, properties the Muslims live in are not owned by them. They're owned by Muslim organizations. So, um, based in Israel or based where? Yeah. Based in Israel or based in Jordan. Uh, so, um, so, you know, it, it, it's very difficult to, to purchase properties under these circumstances. Um, and keep in mind, of course, that the, uh, the Arabs are, you know, the, at least the Palestinian Authority is very anti-Arab selling property to Jews, and there's going to be serious punishments for that. That's not helpful. 
Um, and so the Jews, the Jewish quarter, you know, is built. There's not much you can build in the Jewish quarter. So in terms of building, there's not much that can be done. The people who live here, of course, uh, are very religious in general. And there are a lot of children. Putting it mildly, there are a lot of children. Um, thank God. But, um, you know, even higher, I would say, than the average you know, very religious community. Um, so that, in that sense, we're growing, but. Um, but like, how is it? So you mentioned some of the challenges. So where is that growth coming from? Like, where are they, are they purchasing? You know, I know, for yeah. example, people like uh, R.A. King, you know, I mean, that's, you know, I know you work I think, with them a little bit, if I'm not mistaken. Sure. So how, based on this situation where there's not, you can't, there's not big empty land and, you know, and it's not, uh, and it's very difficult to purchase for a whole bunch of reasons. How, how does growth happen? Well, so the purchases, that's a lot. You know, Ari King, Atera Kohanim, uh, have had success in the last few years. You know, they have success and they, and they purchase properties that Jews can move into. We also keep in mind the old city is surrounded by other neighborhoods. Uh, city of David, uh, Mali Zetim, Shimon Atzadik. Um, you know, these neighborhoods are not the old city, but we also are all very connected. Their kids go to school here. Uh, a lot of their parents work here. So we're all very connected. And in the city of David, uh, and in that area, uh, both the city of David and Atera Kwanim have had a lot of success recently in bringing in more families. Mali's A team is 120, 130 families. Uh, so that's a nice chunk of people also. So the grow, a lot of the growth is happening outside of the walls. Inside of the walls, it's, it's difficult to, you know, it's difficult to, so there, again, there's not much building you can do, if any. And there's, uh, you know, and, and, and purchases are difficult. They do happen, but they're difficult. Wow. Um, and so if people want to find out more about uh, Rabbi, the work you're doing with uh, Jerusalem Heritage, how can they find you online? Uh, our website is heritagehouse.org.io. That's, uh, or on Facebook. I'm on Facebook and uh, I'm pretty good at that. So, uh, you know. I was on it before, you know, when you had to be a student to be on it. That was back in the day. <laughs> wonderful. So, uh, all right, wonderful. So, uh, you know, I really thank you again for joining us. I know it's uh, a little later your time, but as I mentioned, it's being recorded. We'll, uh, we'll send you the link when it's done. It's been on Facebook Live, and I do appreciate your time. This is, you know, you're one of those people, I think, who's, um, you know, I, I sort of look at what you're doing, and I can see you're sort of really living in the beating heart of uh, the Jewish people, and uh, you're not uh, you're not just in the bleachers, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're playing, and so we... Uh, yeah, but I think I just want to say, I, I mean, I appreciate that, of course, but I would just say that, like, I do live here in the middle of it all, and I do that on purpose, of course, as do I think most people who live here. But, you know, people live in Toronto, people live in other places. You can also play a major role. People, if you look at the major things that have happened around here, a lot of it is, you know, we got the Ace World Center over here. Would that have happened without Toronto Jews? I don't know. Uh, you know, people can play a major role here. They really can. Whether it's, of course, donating money, but also make, you know, awareness in the Jewish community when there's not COVID, encouraging people to travel here. There's a lot everybody can do. And yeah, sure, living here makes it easier. I always say I'm like living under the basketball hoop. Yeah, of course, it's easier to score from here. But from anywhere in the court, you can make a basket. So, uh, you know, we're all on the same court here. Let's try to score as many points as possible. Perfect. All right, wonderful. Well, on that uh, on that note, thank you again very much, Rabbi, for uh, for joining us, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll follow more of your uh, good news and good work very soon. I hope so. Very good. Thank you very much. I'm honored. All the best. Take care. Bye. All the best.